I'm going to read one verse. Verse 15. Amen. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes tells about man under the sun. The reason there's some weird sounding verses in it. Is because it's man under the sun. Uh, you never don't you don't base your doctrine in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is not a church doctrine book. That's what makes Jehovah Witnesses believe in soul sleep uh, and people like that. They don't understand the Bible. The dead know nothing <laughs> under the sun. See, this is the book under the sun. If there were no heaven, no hell, nothing like that, this is the way you'd look at life. He took all of his labor under the sun. And said, all is vanity. And uh, so that's where you got to look at this book. This is a great verse here that I'm going to read you. And you look at verse 15. The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them, because he knoweth not how to go to the city. He don't know how to go to the city. I want to preach to you this morning on how to go to the city. Or... How to get to heaven. Sad today, isn't it? It's sad today. That with all of our learning and knowledge, they say that about 80% of the scientists who ever lived are living this morning. They say that about 80 to 90% of all our acquired scientific knowledge we've got in this generation. There has never been a generation just boom with knowledge like this generation. But it's sad that very, very few people, if you stop 50 people out on the street of any city in America and said, show me how to get to heaven, very few would be able to tell you. That's sad, isn't it? I'm talking about church people. I, I would be willing to say this. We are right here smack dab in the middle of the Bible Belt. If you went to half the churches in North Carolina this morning and stop the first 50 people that come out of that church building and said, I want to know exactly how to get to heaven. Show me. Most of them couldn't do it. That's sad, isn't it? Man is ever learning. Never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And I want to tell you this morning how to get to the city. You listen real careful. This may be the most important message somebody in here ever hears. Because... If I recall correctly, I never, I was 18 when I got saved, I never remember one person setting me down and telling me, Danny, here's exactly how you go to heaven. I never remember that. There is a city. Hebrews 11 tells us about it. Revelation 21, 2, 10 tells us one of these days is going to be a great big city coming down out of the sky. It's really that way. And it's coming down from the north, from God out of heaven. Solid city of four square, pointed this way, 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles that way, 1,500 miles back across the other way. That's a whopper, you know it? I mean, that is a big city. People talk about New York. First time I ever saw New York when I flew in there in the airport. And I flew in there to LaGuardia Airport. Boy, I was coming in. I thought, well, this is it. I'm going to see New York. And I could see all those buildings, and they got some big ones. And I could see all those streets. And I seen the Empire State Building, Statue of Liberty, standing out there in the water. And boy, it was a breathtaking sight. And I got to thinking, looking on the map, little New York, little old spot, little dot, bigger than the other dots, but it's a little dot on the map. I got to thinking, we're going to live in a city one of these days that if you put the corner of it down on New York City, that the other corner would reach out past Chicago, nearly halfway across the United States, down to Texas, across to Florida, and back up. Now, there's a city, brother. There is a city. Not only that, that thing is 1,500 miles high. You talk about skyscrapers. You talk about glory boulevards and avenues and beautiful... I'm talking about a city, man. I'm talking about a place that will make built more house and garden over there. Look like somebody's outhouse from the 1700s. I'm talking about a place that really... I'm talking about a place that knocked your eyeballs out, boy. I'm talking about a city. 
You know, I was talking, I preached on heaven the other night, and I got to talking about that big peach tree plaza hotel down in Atlanta. I went up in that thing one time, coming up on this a little bit, Brother Roy, and, uh, we was down there and was giving out tracks, and we was, and I said, I won't go in this thing. I went on the first floor, there was, there was flowers, there was plants, there was water squirting up. I said, boy, it sure is pretty in here. And they had elevators and people in evening gowns and tuxedos and stuff like that. Big shots and limousines outside. And the next floor went up. It was more big plants and flowers and water squirting up. The next story, more plants and water squirting up. And I thought, boy, isn't this something? These people have tried their best to build them a little heaven. They have tried to build them a little garden of Eden that Adam and Eve had. I got to thinking, oh, this dump. I mean, this place couldn't hold a light to where I'm going to live one of these days because I'm saved. There is a city. It has the glory of God. Four walls, great and high, twelve gates, walls of jasper, variety, colored quartz and, and uh, stones will make up these walls. The Lamb of God is the light in this city I'm talking about. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no lying. There'll be no cheating. There'll be no dying. There'll be no more sorrow, no pain, no broken heart and no broken dream. No no funeral home like Sister Carol Lister and then as you know her brother passed away Friday night and they'll be at the funeral home receiving friends tonight and bury her tomorrow. No, our heart must be hurting to see a loved one planted in the graveyard. I'm talking about we're going to a city where that will never ever happen. No sorrow. No sickness. No pain. No, no distress of nations and wars and famines anymore. What a tragedy people don't know how to get there. How sad that it is today that if you stop the first thousand people you meet on any street corner of America, probably not one out of ten would be able to say, I know how to go to heaven and I know I'm going. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, if you live in this world and die and miss heaven, you, you've missed it all. You've been better off never to have been born. I don't care if you own a uh, half a mech. County and you're rich and you've got stocks and bonds and a million dollars in the bank. If you miss heaven when you die, you would have been better off to have never to have been born. I'm telling you this morning how to go to the city. Now the best way I know to do it is do it like Jesus said. The Lord Jesus taught by illustration. And the Lord, everything He said, He taught it by illustration. For example, when the Lord wanted you to know what the Holy Spirit was like, he said, it's like wind. Somebody said, I don't know what the Holy Spirit's like, Lord. He said, well, you know what wind's like, ain't, don't you? Sure, I know what wind. He said, it's like wind. So the Lord took something you don't understand and used something you do understand to explain what you don't understand. When the Lord was talking about spreading the Word of God, the preaching of the Gospel, you know what He compared it to? Spreading seed. Man goes out and takes him some grass seed. He, he just spreads it around. He wants to make sure a seed will get spread out and hit on every spot in that soil. That's why we have missionaries. That's why our brother here is going to Arizona to preach. That's why they're all over the world. We were trying to sow the seed. The Lord said, just like sowing that seed is the way I want you to get the gospel out. Now the Lord said, just like that Holy Spirit is like wind, just like that... Sowing that seed is like, uh, or preaching the word is like sowing seed. He said, the way you get to heaven, he said, if you, you're going to walk in this room this morning, you walked in the door. How many of you people in here this morning came in one of these doors? Would you raise your hand? I hope and pray the Lord that all of you raise your hand. I think I've seen, how did you get in here? Did you crawl under, under one of them? If you came in here this morning, you came in the door. Now, if there's only one door in here, let's say that right there over there was the only door in here. Everybody in here would come in that door. Jesus said, I'm going to tell you how to get to heaven. He said, the Holy Spirit, that's like wind. Preaching the Word, that's like sowing seed. You want to get in heaven? I'm the door. You go through the door to get in heaven. 
Yeah, it's, it's fearful to understand, and yet it's amazing. How many people don't know that? How many people, how many of you in here this morning was at least 20 years old before you understood that the way to go to heaven was through the door of Jesus Christ? Raise your hand. You look at that. And we are right here in North Carolina. It's amazing. The devil does a good job, don't he, of keeping people blinded. You know what most people in North Carolina think? They think if you want to go to heaven that you're supposed to quit doing everything that you know that's wrong and start doing everything that you know is right. There is no word in the Bible where it says that's the way to heaven. Jesus said, you want to go to heaven? I'm the door. You know what He said? He said, I'm the shepherd. You know what a shepherd does? Shepherd opens the gate, lets the sheep in, counts them. He said, I am the shepherd. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, there's the way to get to heaven. Heaven. Never accuse God of making it hard to find out the way to glory. There's a lot of people say, well, it's God. If God is so good and God, how come He's made everything so confusing? God didn't make this mess. God is not the author of all the religious confusion in the world. It's as plain as day. It's sad that men don't know how to go to the city. Most people don't do it. You go out on the street witnessing. You go out and give out tracts and some of our major cities, any of our cities, you walk up and say, Sir, do you want to go to heaven when you die? And they'll look at you and they'll say, I sure would like to, but I just can't live that religion. And you know what they think? They think I'm not good enough and I can never be good enough. And the truth is, they're right. But they just do not understand. Hey man, I'm not good enough. I ain't never lived good enough. I ain't living good enough now. I got enough sense to walk in the door though. And brother, that's how come I know I'm going to the city. I came through the door. Amen. People talking about Peter having the keys. No, Catholic Church having the key. What do we need the keys for, man? We walk through the door. Amen. The door is open. I want to say this morning, I'm going to give you about four quick comparisons tell you how to get to heaven. You listen carefully. If you're not saved, I want to explain this to you. Number one, you can't buy your way in. You accept a free ticket. Little girl's mother years and years ago was very sick. She went, they went to the doctor and they said, this woman has got to have fresh grape juice in order to help her body. That was hundreds of years ago. And they went home, they didn't have no money and no way to get no grape juice. So the little girl went running down to the king's palace. And she went running down there and they had a fence around the palace and she could see the guards around it out front. And she could see the beautiful vineyards inside the king's garden. She said, i got to have some of them grapes. i got to have some of them grapes for my mama or she'll die. Please let me have them. I don't have any money to pay. I can't get them. Let me have them. And the guard said, no, no one gets in here without the king's permission. So the little girl was laying out front crying and weeping because she knew her mama was going to die. About that time a big horse came by. And he came by and somebody stopped and said, little girl, what's the matter with you? You know what it was? It was the king's son. And the king's son looked down at her and said, What's the matter, honey? She said, My mama's got to have some of them grapes in there. If she don't get them, she's going to die. And the king's son said, You just hop up here with me, baby doll. And boy got her up there, sat her on his horse, said, Open! And man, them gates flew open just like that. He took her in there and got her what she needed. I'm telling you tonight, brother, this morning, there was a time when I couldn't get in heaven. I cried and I said, God, I can't do it by myself. But thank God the king's son came by. And he, he saw me out there and said, what's the matter you, boy? I said, I want to get in there, but I can't. He said, come here. He didn't call me baby doll, but he, he, he picked me up. And boy, the gate swung open and I went in. I got a free ticket paid for by somebody else. Hallelujah. I'm glad I'm going to heaven. Don't deserve it. Never have. Never will. But all I've done is just take the ticket. Hey, buddy, I ain't too proud to take something somebody's going to give me if it means keeping me out of hell. Do you? Hey, I don't know a whole lot. I ain't stupid, buddy. I know a good deal when I see one. And if a man's going to pay my way into heaven, I'm not too proud and stubborn to take it. Are you? I was, we was down there preaching at the racetrack. 
week before last, we took all these boys down to the speedway in Darlington. We was preaching out front. We saw these old guys out there. And evidently, they got there late or didn't get tickets. Something they had these signs up said tickets, need tickets, need tickets, and they were walking back and forth in front of the racetrack like this. See, you go in that grandstand there. You can't get in there without a ticket. What if a man walked up there and he said, I want in. And they said, ticket, sir. And he said, well, I'll have you to know I've watched every race that's ever been on TV. And they said, good. Could I see your ticket? And he says, I just want you to know that I'm a Dale Earnhardt fan. <laughs> and they said, that's very nice. There's a lot of them around here. Could I see your ticket? He said, listen, you don't have a bigger fan than me. I tell everybody, there's hundreds of people here because I invited them to this race. They said, good. Could I see your ticket, please? We need to get in a hurry. We're in a hurry here. He said, but you don't understand. Listen, I am the biggest race fan. I am dedicated to this stuff. I got little model cars in my room. I shine them. I, I got Ricky Rudd's name on one. I've got a, a Petty's name on one. I've got a no one's name on one. I want in. And they said, so, listen, sir. Now, you're nice and we, we appreciate all that nice things you've said. But you do not get in this race without a ticket. We're not impressed with how many race cars you've got. It, it's, it's nice and it's fine and all of that. But that does not get you in the race. You know what a lot of people think? You go out, you go out and talk to people if you don't believe I'm telling the truth. You talk to people about going to heaven. And they'll say, boy, when I get up, I'm going to say, God, I've been a pretty good person. God, I have went to Sunday school all of my life. God, I have done my best to pay my bills and, and, and treat people right. And the angel at the gate will say... Uh, well, well, I'm proud of you. Can I see your ticket? And they'll say, but you don't understand. I picked up the Bible at least once a week and read it. And they'll say, fine. Can I see your ticket? And they'll say, do you realize that I didn't smoke, cuss, drink, chew, or fool with them at do? And, and they'll say, well, and that's nice. You lived a few days longer for that. But can I see your ticket? And they'll say, but you don't understand. I went to a Baptist church. And they'll say, well, the God can can save a Baptist too. Could I see your your ticket? And the, and they'll say, but you don't understand. I've done the best I can. Let me tell you something, bud. You don't get in without a ticket. You know what the ticket is? Accepting Jesus Christ as the payment for your sins. Have you ever done that? You're going to heaven. Have you never done that? You're not going to heaven. Boy, a little boy ran in one day from the house and he was hiding from a bee. And a big bumblebee chased him around through the house, you know, and he said, Mama, 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 Mama. And boy, she got him and stuck him under her skirt. And he got down in there hiding under his mama's legs. And her mom stuck out her arm. That bee went, ding! Got her right there. She jumped up that bee off and left that stinger in her arm. She said, Come on, son, he won't hurt you now. He said, he still looks mean to me. Oh no, he won't hurt you. So I got his stinger right here. Little boy can play with that bee. He can put a tie string around its hind leg like you do a June bug. Let it fly around. <laughs> I got you, big boy. Big hornet, man. I mean a big old one. You can't hurt me, little bee. You can't. I mean, he can squish him with his hands. You know why? His stinger's been took out. Death is a big monster this morning. But oh, let me tell you something. It was about ready to get us. And we were running. And the Lord went down like this. Ah! And let him put it in him. And the sting of death went in the Lord Jesus Christ. He took the sting away. You know why we don't have to be afraid to die? The Lord took the sting. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. If your sins are gone, death ain't got no sting no more. Amen? Oh, I tell you what a blessing that is. Jesus was punished instead of us. So God can't punish us when we accept Jesus. Do you understand that? Do you understand? Me. Do you understand me? Not at me. Listen, Jesus Christ was on a cross. The Lord let him be whipped so that God won't whip us when we accept him. He took our punishment. He took our guilt. He took our shame. The Lord died in our stead to open up the way to heaven. Number two, 
You can't hope your way there. You must believe. You can't work your way in. you got to accept the free ticket. You can't hope your way there. You must believe. Many people hope and hope and hope. You know, I would be scared to live. I would be scared to exist in this world if I thought there's a possibility that I was going to hell. Wouldn't you? Ah, so I don't see how people exist from day to day knowing that they could have a wreck and go to hell. Uh, you imagine hell, a place where there's no relief, where you're begging for a drop of water on your tongue, where you're saying, God, God, have mercy on me forever and ever and ever. Can you imagine that? Wouldn't life be miserable? You'd be scared to eat. You'd be scared not to eat. You'd be scared to go anywhere. You'd be scared not to... Why, it'd it'd drive you crazy if you thought there was a chance you're going to hell. But a lot of people just hope and hope. You ask a lot of people, are you going to heaven? They say, I hope I am. They don't know. They don't know how to go to the city. There, listen, you believe and be saved if you'll trust the Lord Jesus Christ. God guarantees you a seat in glory. I don't want to make anybody shout that believes that. Yes, sir. You know what some people think? They think when you repent of your sins, I told them the other night, God puts up a reserve sign on your mansion in heaven. Then, if you do something wrong, He takes that reserve sign down. And puts up a for rent sign on your mansion in heaven. Then when you ask forgiveness, He takes that for rent sign down and puts your name back up there. Then when you sin again, He takes the, for, uh, the whichever one down and puts it in up. <laughs> and brother, listen, that ain't the way it works. When a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior. Hear me. Hear me well. When a person says, I cannot save myself. God, I'm a sinner. God, I can't. I don't know. There's nothing I can do. I'll trust Christ right then. God reserves them a place in heaven. They become a child of God and God begins to work on them and work on them and work on them. April the 19th, 1972, God put a reservation for me in glory. I still got it this morning. I'm, it's waiting on me. Amen. I ain't talking about a room neither. I'm talking about a mansion. I'm talking about a mansion in glory. Not a room like the new Bible say. I've got a mansion over the hilltop waiting on me. And God's going to get me over there one of these days and said, Danny, you believed and I saved it for you. If we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, we shall be saved. Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 9 said, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart God raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Listen. If people knew the devil's doing a good job of making salvation confusing, if people in McDowell County knew how easy and how wonderful it is to be saved, they'd be flooding this church this morning all over these altars, hundreds of them trying to get saved today. Call on the Lord to be saved. I can imagine back there in the book of Exodus at the Passover when the Lord told them to put the blood on that door. He said tonight... I'm going to pass through. When I see the blood, I'll pass over your house. Can't you imagine this man walking back and forth through the house about five minutes till twelve that night? Let me go in there and check him one more time. Goes in there and checks that little firstborn. He's breathing. And his wife's sitting there so and said, For heaven's sake, will you sit down? He said, honey, I, I just don't, I don't know about this. I've not really lived a good enough life. He said, she said, no, wait a minute, hon. Didn't God just say put the blood on the door? Amen. And he says, yeah, but somehow I just don't feel like it's enough. I, I, I'm still feeling guilty over something I've done a long time ago. She said, you're driving me nuts. Will you sit down and quit work? He said, maybe we ought to just pray. I believe if we're praying while the death angel comes over, that he'll pay. She said, God didn't say nothing about praying. He ain't looking for prayers. He ain't looking for Israelites. He ain't looking for Egyptians. He's looking for blood on the door. That's all he cares about tonight. 
And he says, well, I've just not been good. She said, there's none good. No, not one. He said, where'd you learn that? She said, well, I believe somebody's going to write it in a scripture one of these days. And he said, he said, uh, I just don't feel like, a, I just don't feel, uh, I, oh, oh, over here in the next house, there's this fellow laying in here sound asleep. And he's got the blood on his door. Which one of them's the safest? Which one of them is more saved than the other one? And many people spend their entire life wringing their hands. Well, well I'm a, I just don't know if I, I, maybe maybe I. Well, you'll wind up in a nut house like that. You're going to have to relax, man. Now, here's a way to look at it. Look. If we, if you, if you're dependent on the life you're living, forget it. We're all going to hell. Uh, yeah. Amen. <laughs> There's none good, no, not one, brother. And I'm telling you this morning, if we got what we deserve, and none of us are saved. But there's one thing we can shout about and rely on the blood, the blood, the blood. The blood's on the door. Hallelujah. The blood's on the door. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Number three, you can't try to work and live it to get in. You must trust the only one who ever did live it. I've heard people say, boy, if anybody ever lived it, Grandma did. You're wrong, brother. Grandma didn't live it. If anybody ever lived it, Jesus did. He's the only one that ever has lived it. He's the only one that ever will live it. You don't go to heaven by living it. You go to heaven by trusting in the only one who ever has lived it. Let me show you. But John, come here just a second. Well, Sam, Gene. Now, Brother John, you sit right here this morning. And brother John is, is going to be... God on the throne. <laughs> Full of wrath. God looks down and He said, I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No, Sam here, he's pretty sharp for a young man, ain't he? He ain't got long hair. Ain't got no earring. I'm glad you got your earring out this morning. He got, he got a nice Bible over there. He, he's cool. I mean, I mean, he's, he's an upstanding, fine young man. And Sam wants to go to heaven. But God looks down and He says, Can't get in here. Only way you can get in there is be perfect. You're either perfect or you go that other place. He said, But God, I want to go to heaven. I want to go. I want to be up there with you, can I? I promise I'll never do nothing wrong as long as I live. How old are you, brother Sam? Nineteen. I'm 19 years old from this moment on. I will straighten up. I'll never cuss. I'll never drink. I'll, ne I'll never go to the movies. I'll never do, I'll never go hang out in honky tonks. I, I ain't never gonna uh, run around on my wife. I ever have one. I mean, I, I ain't gonna do it. And God says, well, there's a little problem here, Sam. Two problems. Problem number one, that ain't true. Cause I know the future and I know you're gonna do some wrong stuff. Problem number two is even if you did live perfect from now on the rest of your life, who's going to pay for all these sins you've committed these last 19 years? You see, stay right there just a second, boys. You come up here, Gene. You see, friend, if you decided to straighten up at 30 years old and said, all right, I'm going to get my act together. From now on, I'm going to do right. I'm never going to do a wrong thing. Even if you could do that, who's going to pay for all them sins you committed 30 years? What's going to do with them? Where are they going to go? Who's going to answer for them? So, God looks down in the world and He sees Sam, all us wicked people like us, and the Bible says God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Stretch your hands out, Gene. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You understand that? It's so simple. It blows my mind. Stick your hands out, Gene. 
It blows my mind. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad the Lord didn't, wasn't as lazy as you are. Now, listen. It, listen, it blows my mind that we have college-educated professors and scientists in the world that don't understand that. The devil, the God of this world, has blinded their mind. Listen, I hope and pray to God somebody let the Lord let the scales fall from your eyes this morning. Once that becomes clear in your mind, once you see that Jesus paid the price, once you see that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and they none of us no count, and the only reason we're saved is trusting in Him. Boy, it's happy day. Oh, happy day. Happy day. That fixed my choice. It was the happiest day of my life. When I realized he paid the price for my soul. You know what? Here comes Jesus down and dies on the cross. Blood shed. He didn't have to die because he never sinned. The wages of sin is death. He never sinned, so why did he die? He died for our sins. So here goes Sam. God, let me in heaven. God says, Can't do it. You're sinful. And Sam says, God, can I ever get right? And God says, the only way you can ever get in here is be perfect. And he says, well, hang it up, man. I might as well go. And the Lord says, wait a minute. Wait just a second. Here's a man. Lived perfect. 33 and a half years. Tempted as all points like we are. His blood was shed. You know whose blood that was inside him? God's blood. Life. So, Sam says, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Come over here and kneel down, Brother Sam. He comes down and he says, Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And I believe Jesus died for my sins. You know what then God does? All right, Jesus, you come over here. Stand right here between God and Sam. Point toward God. Now, when God looks at Sam, he sees Jesus. Jesus lived a perfect life. Did you know this morning that Sam is perfect? Quit grinning. <laughs> Don't bow your head. We're not praying. When God sees him, he sees him perfect. When God sees him, he's never sinned. When God sees him, you know why? He's trusted Jesus Christ. That's the way you go to heaven, folks. People say, I'll just get all emotional and I'll cry. And, oh, God! Now, you might get through that and you might not. You're not saved by crying. You're not saved by having an emotional fit. You're not saved even by praying. You're saved by believing. There's a lot of people pray all the time and ain't going to heaven. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. That's all there is to it. One day when Sam dies, God will say, come on in. And the devil will say, don't let him in. Don't let him in. Did you see what he's done? He don't deserve to be in. God said, I didn't see a thing. I see this man right here. When I look at him, okay, you boys can sit down. You don't go to heaven by living it. You go to heaven by trusting the only one who ever did live it. Man said, I said, how are you going to heaven? He says, well, I'm trying to do the best I can and I'm doing this and I've took the sacraments and I've kept the commandments and I'm, I'm really trying as hard as I can. You look at somebody like that and say, man, why did Christ die on the cross? What's the purpose of Jesus coming down here and dying? If you can live good enough to get to heaven. If you kept every commandment 24 hours a day, you still don't go to heaven till you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Lastly, and I'm going to say this and I'm going to quit right quickly. You can't sneak your way in. You must be a part of the family. You must be born again. Jesus compared it to being born. You know how to get saved? Jesus compared it to being born. Now listen, when a little baby's born, who's got the littlest baby in here? Anybody got one of them two-weekers? Stand hand it up over there, ma'am. There's a little bitty brand new baby this morning. Look at it. 
Don't break his neck. <laughs> Amen. Isn't that sweet? How old is he? she? She was born Wednesday. Already in church this morning. Boy, I'm glad you brought that little baby this morning. The Lord wanted to use her for something. As of Wednesday, that little girl, it's a girl, ain't it? That little girl had a brand new, she had no past. She had no past. You don't see her over there worrying about what she done two months ago. You don't say, you don't, she's not going, I bet she don't feel a bit guilty right now. All she's got is a big, bright future. She's a newborn baby. Now listen, when God, when you get saved, when you come and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're like a brand new baby. You have no past. You have no past. Your past is gone. You're starting out like a little baby. Brand new, fresh. Listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but you know why people have to go to a psychiatrist many times? I'm not knocking psychiatry right now, but I tell you what, brother, most people go to a psychiatrist to try to relieve guilt feelings of something they've done a long time ago. And they say, well, it's because of this, and I wasn't treated right, and uh, my daddy never got me that electric train when I was in the fifth grade, and it warped my personality, and, and uh, that's why I killed my mother-in-law. And, uh, you know, that's crazy. The reason people feel guilty is because they're guilty. The only way you can ever get rid of your guilt is be born again. You was born wrong the first time. When you get born again, you have no past. You have new future. You have a brand new life. Fresh start with a clean slate. I've used the illustration many times about when we was little, we used to draw on them little things that had this gray paper on them. And you'd write like, I'd write, Danny. Danny. Then I get tired of looking at it. And you go. And you start all over again. You know, and the little things that had gray sheets on them and you could write with a pencil. See, when I come down here, it had, when I got saved, it had sin, sin, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, summer after the fourth grade. Lord in mercy. He had a lot bigger sheet than this. Danny lied. Danny cussed. Danny stole. Danny didn't serve God. Danny didn't put God first in his life. Danny had other gods before God. Danny did this. Danny did that. And that's why I come to God. And I said, Lord, I believe your son died for me. I want that blood to take my sins away. And the Lord go, Amen. Amen. And boy, when he done that, it was quiet as that little part right there. No future. New future. No past. That's the way to go to heaven. That's the way to go to heaven. They said years ago that a man painted a picture and he done this art, artistic work and it had a picture of Jesus knocking at the door. And a critic come by and looked at it. He said, that's not a very good painting. The guy said, why? And he said, see, you've left the doorknob off. What kind of an artist would leave off a doorknob? He said, sir, you don't understand. That's a picture of Jesus knocking at our heart's door. And the human heart has but one knob. And that knob's on the inside. You've got to open your heart, see. The Lord ain't going to come to your heart and knock like He is this morning. And just grab the door and open it up and say, All right, here I am, I'm going to save you, like it or not. There's a, there's a door on the inside of your heart. You have to make that choice to open that door and let the Lord come in. How to go to the city? Just trust Jesus. You know what some of you need to do? You need to come down here and get down on your knees once and for all. You say, I'm the meanest person in this town. Great. You're just the man we've been looking for. Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. Somebody said the other day in the camp meet, if God can save a chief, He can sure save all us Indians. And the chief got saved. <laughs> Thank God the chief got saved me and you just little Indian sinners we can get into. You say, preacher, I'm afraid that I can't live it. Well, I can tell you that right now. I know you can't. You say, I know a man that's perfect. No, you don't. You don't know no man that's perfect. Somebody walks up to you and tells you they ain't sinned in five years. <laughs> you know, you can snigger. You can snigger. That person ain't telling the truth. Tell me they ain't sinned in no five years. They're dead if they ain't sinned in five years. 
They're lying when they say that. Ain't no hope. You can't live it. But I've got some good news for you. Man bought you a free ticket. And if you'll come and trust him, you say, well, I've done it. It didn't work. No such thing. If you've done it, it worked. You may have strayed out of God's will. You may have your life in trouble. But if you trust Jesus Christ, your Savior, it works. Let's stand by our head. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Been to get us a song this morning. This message will go out on tape and different on, and on radio in different parts of the country. No doubt thousands of people will hear what you just got through hearing. And I pray God will use it to speak to some man's heart, some woman's heart, and get them saved and tell them how to go to heaven. But my concern right now is not for the thousands that will hear this tape or on the radio. It's for the hundreds that sit right in here in these seats this morning. It's for that man that's here this morning whose life is all messed up. It's for that lady who's here this morning who's never, ever really known for a fact that she's saved. Ma'am, why don't you come down here and get down on your knees and let one of these ladies take a Bible and, and show you exactly how you know you're saved. Sir, why don't you come on this morning and let God save you? It's the most simple, easy thing in the world, and yet many people don't know how to go to the city. Has it ever happened to you? Have you ever walked through the door? Have you ever been born again? Why don't you let it happen to you this morning? Dear God, please, by the Holy Spirit of God, convict. Use the Word of God to convict sinners' hearts right now. Lord, you're the only one that can do it. And I pray you do your work right now. Break someone's heart for sin. And then lead them to the Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen.